hello and welcome to this um, fireside chat, which is what I've been calling it for, I guess, about a week now. Uh, I've been joined by a couple of people of varying levels of fame, which is kind of crazy for me because I am nobody. I'm slightly more of a somebody than Nas, but hey, we love him anyway. But that's not important. What is important is we are here tonight to talk about a couple of different subjects on the sub on the setting of Shadowrun and GMing it and a couple of other things that come up. We'll see what happens. So just to go around the table to the people that I have recruited for this tonight, uh, let's start with the, the Neo-Anarchist himself because he's, I guess, the guy that's been doing this the longest. That could be true, but hello, everyone. It's me, Opti, from the Neo-Anarchist podcast and... I GM sometimes as well, so I'm glad to be here. I'm also aware of the fact that you occasionally play as per the Dice Crimes game that uh, we all got to listen to. <laughs> that was the first time I have actually played uh, in probably over a year. <laughs> that is that is unfortunate. You should get to play more often. More often. See, it's getting it's happening more now, but that was a, a very welcome change. And it is happening more now, and somebody else who broke in there as I was trying to make a segue and failing. But hey, that's what this is all about, improving ourselves and our segues. Uh, Mr. Complex Action. Hello. That is the uh, that is probably safe to say the rallying cry of GMs everywhere. I wish I could play more often. It, it absolutely is. It is 100% the truth. But we'll, we can talk about your opportunities to play later on. And then the the final voice that I'm joined with, the freshly rebooted Plot Resistance Livecast, uh, their GM on the reboot, uh, Mr. Oz. Hello, not, everybody. Not to be confused with being great and or powerful. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I already got a burned edge from the first run of the series, so I'm feeling pretty all-powerful right now. Oh. It wasn't one of mine, so that's fine. Not yet. So I I floated around a small list of suggestions for topics for tonight. The guys over at the Milk Run podcast unfortunately had real life stuff pop up, so their GM wouldn't be able to join us tonight. But they did send us over two topics. Uh, Mr. Oz has a couple of topics, and I threw a couple of topics in there. Is there anywhere that someone in particular wants to start with? Um. Uh, you know what this this uh, this question from the Milk Run podcast? The how do you pitch Shadowrun? I think that is a great way to start things off. It's almost as if starting at the beginning is a good idea, right? Yes. Awesome. So we will we'll start with that and like the Shadowrun elevator pitch. Yeah, and I'm yeah. pretty sure the guy who's does his thing based upon selling Shadowrun to people should be the one to, to kind of kick us off, I guess. Is that me? Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, what, I, what I tell people, um, and this is really unimaginative, but uh, it seems that it, it kind of gets the point across, is I say, you know, it's like The Matrix meets Lord of the Rings, uh, and if you play on my table, then we'll be fighting the man. That's 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 the the pitch that seems to have worked around my table. Damn the man! It doesn't it doesn't need to be a particularly, um, you know, like like unique or quote unquote original pitch. I mean, it just needs to be a pitch that works. That's kind of what I do. I mean, people know those those products, right? I hope so. It yeah. gets awkward if they if they haven't. It's like, are you sure you're hanging out with nerds? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I like to when I pitch it to people, I do it similarly. I say, you know, Lord of the Rings and The Matrix, and you know, I throw in a little like corporate espionage, and then you know, with a dash of uh, elves riding motorcycles and throwing grenades and stuff. And I, I think that kind of if if you're not if you're not interested after hearing that, then you're probably not going to be too interested in Shadowrun. It's, you know, actually, uh, uh, lately, I've been asking people if they've ever seen the show Leverage. And if they say mm -hmm. yes, then I go, it's like that with magic. <laughs> that, 
that there was a, a small list that I passed around a while when people would ask about it. Uh, they usually were like, oh, where do you get ideas for runs? And the list I gave them contained the original 80s A-Team show episodes, because that mm-hmm. is 100% hooding. Uh, it contained Leverage, Sons of Anarchy. Mohawk. Yeah, right? It's like, oh no, they've locked the riggers in a garage full of equipment to do stuff and make a giant death machine. That is kind of where it goes. Throw in some some magic and some uh, fantasy creatures and some crazy future tech. There's a, a couple of animes too, like Ghost in the Shell and other stuff that is pretty spot on with how the whole cyberpunk dystopian future goes. Um, it almost always seemed to be, hey, it's like this one thing, but then add a little bit of this other thing in either like Lord of the Rings with guns or Blade Runner with magic. Right. But don't you think sometimes the way you pitch it kind of, it depends on who you're talking to. Do they have experience with role-playing games and what kind? And if they don't have any experience, then then I, you know, you got to approach it from a totally different like angle. Sure. I like to, um, I, I, I like to, uh, ignore all of the, the movies or the shows that I could use to tie into it. And I just, uh, straight up will ask somebody, have you ever thought about robbing an armored car or robbing a bank? Have you ever thought about stealing something? If so, how would you do it? And have I got a game for you? Plus there's elves and fireballs and stuff. <laughs> right. I'm glad you said that, too, because that's kind of... I have... The experience that I have having to pitch Shadowrun is to people who have never played role-playing games before, and that's kind of the approach that I take that that you just said. I kind of start with describing, hey, you get to be these awesome kind of... kind of, you know, criminal types that 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 are doing these sorts of crimes for money you know they're they're deniable assets and um and and then i go from there right and it's it it gains a lot of interest because you throw something out so bold as yeah i run a game where we rob banks for a living and it's just you can always you can hear that record the record scratch and everybody just turns and looks at you because you just admitted to being a criminal and they're like what what do you mean? And then you just start, you know, you start feeding out that forbidden fruit. You give them that that first little free taste. They're like, yeah, come on over here and let's talk about how you would rob a bank. What would you need to do it? And then all of a sudden, you're in character generation and people are getting really involved. So, somebody is staticking kind of hard. Not it. My mic's been off. Not me, me either. Too. <laughs> but to uh, to continue with what you're saying, a lot of people, and it seems like it seems like you guys as well, um, like to try to think of television shows and movies and stuff to relate it to. And the most success I've ever had is is I like to try to see if if these potential players have ever watched uh, Firefly before, because I think that that is like at least the games that I like to run matches. Uh, that kind of feeling really well of Firefly. I've only watched like the first four episodes of Firefly, and I know that loses. But me that's some enough. Cred. <laughs> oh, the show's great. Okay, I'm out. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> we lost Opti. Um. Yeah, we also lost wherever my train of thought was going right there. The uh, choo choo. Right, leaving the thought station. Um. It's an interesting situation because most of your tabletop RPGs, you're playing the stalwart heroes of the lands off to save the princess and that kind of thing. And if you have a group of experienced tabletop people, the idea that, no, you will you will topple no kingdoms, you will save no days, at best, you will be arrested and thrown in jail, at worst, you will be treated as a terrorist and shot on sight, is kind of yeah. a... It's funny that you say that because when I pitched uh, Shadowrun to my Dungeons and Dragons group that had been going on for years, um, that's actually more the tack that I took. You know, instead I said, you know, instead of fighting dragons, you know, the dragons. If you see a dragon, you will run in fear or you will die. You know, you'll you'll never. 
become gods. You'll never kill gods. You'll never do anything very important. You're just going to be poor people who do crime for money. Yeah, and that that was very appealing to them. I right. I feel like for a a typical D and D table, it is a way to get that evil campaign that everybody wants to play out of their system, without it turning into the I'm going to be the last to sleep so I can murder everybody and take their stuff. You know, I think for the D and D group on the go, I think Shadowrun is one of those games where it never matters how powerful that that character gets. Like you could have an epic level campaign, quote unquote, but there's always somebody more powerful than you. Like we've we've heard the D and D stories about you know this team of adventurers just going up to Asgard and murdering their way through the Pantheon, killing Tiamat, killing Bahamut, just murdering everything. And then at the end, they are the most powerful beings in the universe. Shadowrun, we, we don't get that. It is, you can try and ruin a corp, but they've got a million times the resources you do. And you can strike a, a massive blow for, for anarchy or for the shadows, but ultimately, things are kind of kind of go back to normal because that satellite's just going to focus on you from low Earth orbit, and you're going to see that tungsten rod coming down from space. And like, well, it was it was a good time. We we we've made an impact, and they just changed the map again. Literally, in the case of a Thor shot, the uh... yeah, it's one of those things that is also a pretty big culture shock. Um... In D&D, you're encouraged to murder your way to fame and glory, where Shadowrun is very much the opposite of what you want to do. So it's... Right. Right. And to to bring it back, I guess, more pointed to, to answering the question of how do you, like, specifically, how do you pitch Shadowrun? I think the way to start is is f- know who you're pitching it to and find out what kind of experience they have and figure out how to either relate it to the experience they have or to tell them how it's different. And and I think some of those things that you guys are mentioning are really important to me- to, to point out. Opti and I, I know, Opti, you and I have talked about this before, how Shadowrun is so different, like you guys are saying, that you're, you're kind of a nobody and uh, who's wanting to be do good in the world uh, you know if you're playing that kind of campaign but the point is that you know show show how it's different from the experience that those people already have yes excellent so i guess that means we we slide topics a little bit here um do we want to finish off the other milk runs thing or are we going to go into a more segue ish thing well, uh, I'm going to stick real quick on that, just to tag on to what Bobby was saying. Um, one of the big differences between Shadowrun and, well, Dungeons and Dragons in particular is that Dungeons and Dragons is more uh, is more a tool for GMs or DMs in their case to to tell their stories, and Shadowrun is a little bit different in that you are playing in somebody else's sandbox that's more or less static. Um, and so that, that actually changes the rules for what you can do. Nobody expects you in Shadowrun to become, you know, the president of Ares or anything like that. But in Dungeons and Dragons, um, you know, that's entirely possible because it's the GM's world. Um, that's a really good I know, point. I know that, you know, D&D has, you know, some static worlds. But but even so, um, I think in, in the games that I play, the GM almost always does their own thing. Shadowrun... You know, there's at least some attempt to kind of stay uh, consistent with the world that exists already. That can actually just work at a work as a topic for the moment. Where not to to rag on D and D, but it is the oldest, longest running, and probably still most popular system out there. So it's what a lot of people know. But the major things we've kind of touched on that make it different in that you're not going to murder your way to fame and glory. You will not make any drastic changes to the world. You're just people trying to get by for the most part and get rich or die trying. Um, is there any core concepts of Shadowrun you feel really set it apart from your standard fantasy RPG? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so first, it's it's grounded in the real world, um, at least uh, at least somewhat. So the 
the concepts, you know, are the concepts that people deal with on an everyday basis. Um, and I think Bobby and I had discussed this once upon a dream. Um, but in Shadowrun, it's it's kind of fundamentally different in that it's not wish fulfillment uh, for wish fulfillment's sake. There's an element of critique going on, critique of uh, our current culture, critique of technology. Um, there's an element of fear and kind of what what's going to happen. Can we go too far with Dungeons and Dragons or any other kind of generic fantasy setting? It's just pure, you know, fantasy. What can I do? I want to escape, and I don't think Shadowrun really lets you do that complete escapism. And I think that's that's a that's a strength. Yeah, I agree. I uh, I personally like that um, whether or not I live or die is is not based on a single d20 because I habitually roll low. Um, that was always my beef with D and D is that I'm supposed to be this this badass adventurer, and if I'm rolling a two on that d20, I'm not getting anything done. Whereas Chatteron, out of the gate, you can have a character that will take you from from rags to riches and you don't have to put a single point in another skill if you're starting off with like 12 dice 10 dice i mean you want to go up a little bit but like once you hit about 14 16 dice your primary skill very little is going to fail it is statistically improbable that you're you're going to that you're that you're going to fail so that's what i've always liked about shadowrun and then, um, I think having that grounding in in real history, like anybody who plays Shadowrun, if you've studied history up until 1981, you know what happened in the world. And then, yeah, you know, once once the the Shiawase and the Saratek decisions hit, that's where the split is. And then. You, you see where all that 80s glam comes in. And now in you know we're in mid-fifth edition, it's 2078, and we're seeing the same things in reality that we predicted in Shadowrun 25 years ago. Yeah, and I think that is... Yeah, it, that's what makes Shadowrun feel so personal and feel so familiar and feel so good. Um, is that uh, it's grounded in the world world. And and I think you're absolutely right about the, you know, we keep comparing it to Dungeons and Dragons because it's almost like an, the opposite end on so many spectrums in the art, in the tabletop world. And it's like, like you were saying, you know, you, you could be this practical demigod and you roll a, a one on your D20 and your mace bounces off a cobalt skull doing no nothing at all. <laughs> but um, in Shadowrun, you can be this, this uh this great guy who just gets um you know there's always the threat of you being geeked by some squatter on the street you know sure has, i mean has anybody else noticed that um that old trope about science fiction becoming uh science fact. becoming reality science fact um it really doesn't apply in the way that we wanted it to because we all watched star trek and we thought like oh yeah i can't wait for that and we played Shadowrun thinking, like, well, at least it'll never get to this. And then when you open up the newspaper, you're like, holy shit, I live in Shadowrun. Where's my Star Trek or Star Trek yeah. future? <laughs> is it, that really is funny, isn't it? You, like you said, there was such, like, joy and hope and optimism in hoping we'd get to where Star Trek was. But us Shadowrun fans who, who are on the Facebook and Reddit and stuff, the, the message is, oh, God, we're getting closer. This is really terrible. And we're getting the bad parts of getting closer. We're not getting magic yeah. and cool <laughs> right. stuff. Right, right. There's, there's no magic to balance out that horrifying, horrifying cyberpunk that's coming. Yeah, that we're, but that that goes along with what you were saying, Opti. That that Shadowrun is so much, you know, a commentary. Um, one of the things that I like a lot about Shadowrun, and this kind of goes on both sides of the coin, is that the common people is something that's very um, very palpable, I guess is maybe not the word I want, but like you can play a person who, in your fantasy world, in most of those games, the person you're playing is an adventurer. They are special. They are marked by fate to do crazy things because that's where your game goes. 
in Shadowrun, you could be somebody who... There's a horrible story about a troll who picked up a comlink off a guy in an alleyway telling him to go here for a job, and that troll was just really confused, and he was a gardener. So he rolls into combat and throws, like, a terrible punch at the dude because he was a gardener, and that's the kind of character that that guy made. Probably a joke character, but hilarious when you look at him and he has, like, artisan and all the knowledge skills to represent it and some of the engineering skills and that kind of stuff. That's I like not... that about Shadowrun, yeah. I mean, you can, you can be that absolute nobody who happens to fall through the cracks and all of a sudden you're a sinless shadow runner yeah you're the guy that was a knight errant detective who all of a sudden the matrix crash 2.0 happened and he lost his sin while being undercover Uh oh and you will never be damian knight period you're just going to die that way and mean nothing yep (laughs) um and then on the other side of things in your your fantasy game when you start getting into those upper echelons of power, your the idea that a common peasantry could oppose you is ludicrous. Like you and your party of adventurers could roll into any medium sized town and kill every member in sight because that's how that game works. Right. I mean, the, you know, in 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 Dungeon Dragon, not bagging on it. I mean, because I had a D and D group for a long time and I really enjoy it. But I mean, the fact that when you hit a certain level, you just start asking, okay, what is my epic destiny? Right, like I mean, like the the, the like literally, uh, right? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. Like the uh, uh, <laughs> what am I trying to say? The um, uh, the privilege that comes with not saying, "Do I have an epic destiny?" But what is my epic destiny? I mean, it's, it's like <laughs> it's fundamentally different from Shadowrun. Yeah, well, the those peasants in Fantasylands aren't a threat, but when every peasant in Shadowrun has a comlink with a camera on it and they can all of a sudden watch you just murder a dude in broad daylight and you turn around and there's eight people uploading it to their me feeds and it's like do you stop and murder all of them now because cops Most are on the way do, yes <laughs> yeah i i love that in Shadowrun, um even even the lowliest peasant can can be dangerous like that we had a, a game on the hub at one point um one of the runners, a dwarven berserker, um, he uh, he was heading to the meeting place. He had no car, so he had to hoof it. And he got uh, tased to near unconsciousness by an 11-year-old elven waif with a taser. And this is like a, a six-dice character, and she just dug it dug it into his back she just, she did the charge action she was up to eight and she scored like max successes like five or six successes on eight dice and just tased this dude down the player was just he hated it because his berserker was running the entire night it just set set the tone <laughs> it was great uh, i believe yeah. he was actually a shifter not a uh oh that's right he was a shifter well he was also he was a berserker shifter too yeah which is hilarious because right you failed your surprise roll, get zapped. Um, but this will actually segue into the the making commonplace people threatening thing that I kind of wrote down as one of my topic suggestions. And this, I that. guess, gets into more of the pseudo-mechanical aspects rather than themes of Shadowrun, which I guess is a, a good place to start for that. So I already mentioned the, the horde of people with their comlink cameras. What are some of the the other ways that you guys would make Joe Wage Slave a danger to a shadow runner of any uh, real karmic level? Well, um, I I have banked my hub career on making commonplace people threatening. Um, I have plenty of stories. Uh, my favorites tend to be, um, you know, the the inner city gangers that that we all see in Shadowrun are are basically the kobolds of the Shadowrun universe. We always have them. They don't uh, they don't seem to pose much of a threat, but you give three of them Molotov cocktails, and it doesn't matter how many dice you've got. That's that's an indirect uh, that's an indirect fire. If it's three hits or better, it's on target, and you're getting lit on fire. And it's going to force uh, even a seasoned runner team to take cover. Um, same thing with ambush tactics. Shadowrun combat works because the Shadowrunners are setting a stage and they are controlling the situation. If they lose that control, 
they get on the back foot, they have got to either panic, sp- uh, hold hold down the bank switch and hope for the best, or they've got to get the heck out and reassess what's going on and try and retake control of that. And you can do that with an HTR team. You can do that with a bunch of rating one Halloweeners. Agreed. Yeah, two uh, two grenades inside a safe house will kill anybody. Sure. Um, I think one of my one of my most famous jobs was I took a seasoned team of Shadowrunners to clear out a four story building that was in Redmond. It was condemned. It was scheduled to be knocked down, but they had a high value target on the top floor, and the only opposition I had on this run was three Halloweeners that were rating one. They had uh, Molotov cocktails and that was it. And then I had a bunch of passive traps because it was a um, it was a Joker XB that, that owned this place before the high value target moved in. So mechanical trip wires um, uh, pop out targets with acid balloons on them. Just, you know, the little glass vials. So you, sh- you shoot the thing, roll the dice and if you get the one, then you get sprayed with acid. Um, the most favorite was there were four motion sensors that activated trapdoors, and all the trapdoors were in the same place on, on each floor, and they, they went from a, the roof all the way down to the basement. And if you tripped one of those and you fell through, then you'd fall all the way down to the bottom. And if you were a body score of five or greater you were going to punch through the trampoline that was at the bottom and fall into a vat of chemicals. <laughs> and if you were under that, you were going to bounce off the trampoline, the door was going to close, and you were going to slam your head up into the ceiling. And the greatest thing that happened is that I actually used the... Uh, <laughs> I used the Molotov cocktails, I lit the troll on fire. Of course, he's soaking all the fire damage, but... He's 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 a metahuman torch at this point, and he is running for his life down the hall. He trips that and goes straight down to the basement. He gets the fire put out, but then he's soaked in toxic chemicals for the rest of the night. I had another guy. He hit the acid. He had to throw his armor off, and he was running around the building, literally, for the rest of the game, trying to catch people who were leaving, but nobody left. Just... Passive traps are amazing, and they're, they're just, they can be set by somebody with a three logic or a three intuition, because it's really, really simple. A piece of string and a grenade is really all you need beyond your closed door. It really <laughs> is. I, um, as a GM, I, I tend to try to make, I tend to try to use the uh, runners and the players' need for anonymity as a way to make everything constantly threatening. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, you can set up these, these physical combat threats here and there, and those are great ways, but in an ongoing campaign, you know, the, I, I, the way that I do it is, is, you know, you, the runners, if they're wearing lots of armor, you know they're going to be able to get through a lot of things. And as time goes on, they're going to be able to get through a lot of things. But, but as long as, as there are always those situations where they're going to need to be defenseless, because you can't just walk around all the time with you know your your heavy body armor on and your you know uh, submachine gun on strapped to your back you know you can't do that constantly because anonymity is something that you rely on as a shadow runner you you're going to get spotted noticed by anybody on the street and i just i try to use that i try to you know either either the runners are misbehaving by or the players are misbehaving by by assuming that they can always be wearing this armor and so i use that against them meaning that they'll get noticed and tracked down by um, night errant or corporate security or something like that. Or they're going to be smart enough to not be wearing and doing all this stuff very obviously all the time. And then you can throw all sorts of things at them, like like minor threats on the street, because um, one of the, the, the biggest advantages that they have, they've left at home in their duffel bag. 
the amount of times on the hub that I have asked people, it's like, are you sure when they're an orc who has a katana and wants to go somewhere? It's like, well, I have a license. I'm like, yes, you have a license to walk around with a katana in the middle of downtown. The Knight Errant Yeah, and folks, Knight Errant also has a license to harass you. <laughs> they are allowed right. to change their patrol path to follow you. Because yeah, wa- walking while goblinized is probably one of the most powerful weapons in the hub's arsenal. Right. Um, rolling probable cause when the rigor and the, when the rigor drives up, and that GMC bulldog that's got eight weapon ports with an Ares Alpha at each, and a wasp on the you know on the top mount rack, and you pop that thing open, and it's got two steel lynxes, two roto drones, and about fifteen thousand rounds of ammunition. You know, you do one matrix perception, you're like, well. You just wandered into night errant territory, and they aren't taking very kindly to this. And probably there are people everywhere, you know. So making commonplace people threatening is is making them behave like real people. So you know the whole "if you see something, say something" kind of idea. If 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 a regular Joe on the street sees you know this huge troll walking around with a bandolier of of explosives <laughs> yeah sure night errant might not have spotted you but that um that person with their kid trying to go down to the McHugh's for lunch might just decide that um you know they need to alert the authorities <laughs> how quickly they'll sell you out right yeah. absolutely um it's making the world respond as it as it should. Um, we see it nowadays. If you guys have ever taken the uh, a plane or a train or the subway or anything, you will see signs that are posted up of like, if you see a suspicious bag, please notify number or something along those lines. And yeah, I, exactly. In the sixth world where everything is recorded and reported and monitored and all of that other wonderful dystopian stuff that we know and love. It's going to be that, but worse. Right. And even if you're in a place where, where the law enforcement isn't a big threat, like the, like out in the Redmond Barrens, right? You still can't do it there. You can't walk around like you're the hot stuff and you can do whatever you want. Because I mean, am I right? Opti like, like the street, justice is going to kick in if you're trying to do stuff like that (laughs) no that's right i mean you walk through halloween or territory with a katana out and that that's going to end your end your day exactly absolutely you you may not have to go through a security check and they don't care if you have a sin or not but you know that's still their turf and you're in it at the very least you got to pay their toll yeah, and I think and I think that's <laughs> I think that's the conceit of Shadowrun is that the entire world is just a mic or a macrocosm of those those barons. You know, what I mean, like, it might not be the Halloweeners, but if you don't have the right credentials and you're in knight errant territory, you're gonna basically have that same bad day. Or if you're in an arcology where you don't belong, or if you're you know in a in a in a country where you don't belong, you know the, the the justice and the ends will be the same. Your your life will be threatened some way, shape, or form uh, just because you don't belong. Right, and this makes me think of something that is kind of tangentially related, if you'll excuse just a couple of seconds, um, which is I've seen a lot of people in my time assume that if you're if you're in an area where the street gang is um, is is the law. That that means you can just do anything because street gangs, you know, they're they don't care about stuff and they're not going to care if you are walking around with your, you know, heavy pistols twirling around and shooting like in the air. (laughs) But but I think what people forget is like like for the most part, like street gangs, even like they care about their turf like they're in charge and and they've they're maintaining the authority because they're they're making people safe most yeah. of the time. I mean, there are exceptions, but... The, the moment you as a street gang don't do something that you're demanding protection money for is when you're collecting protection money becomes way harder on you. And who wants to do that? 
I mean, I think, I, I think, in some ways, street gangs, uh, street gangs are what they are, right? I mean, like nobody can say like, oh yeah, street gangs are super good for everyone. But sure, sure. <laughs> if you're if you're if you're on the inside, then they really do work like any other sort of uh, self governance that we have. I mean, if you're in America and you're an American citizen, well, good for you. But if you're not, and can I say this? Like, we act an awful lot like a street gang to people that aren't us. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a good it's, point. It's, it's, the scale is just different. Yeah, no. Far be it for me to try and censor a neo-anarchist, right? <laughs> It's just, it's just not going to happen. Did I shut down the conversation? No, you, you put so. you put a nice, a fine point on it. That was a, uh, that was that was good. Yeah, it was. <laughs> So should we transition to another topic? <laughs> <laughs> well, damn, I was muted. <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. I, I thought we have, a, we have a large period of awkward silence here. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was one of those times where it I failed to see it out of the corner of my eye on my mic. Um, Because, you know, Skype likes to mute you every once in a while and that kind of stuff. But, um... This actually makes a decent segue into threat escalation because we've gone from the the common people and there's there's a chart in the book that's in these areas after um, after X time HDR will fall and everybody will die because that's kind of how it goes. But there's little um, there's little details on what leads up to until that time. Um, Stuff like the the on-site security, the local security of Knight Errant or Lone Star, and then finally the HTR. And then the book doesn't say it's like HTR arrives this many minutes after they are called. And then what happens after that? Like, what are their common tactics and stuff to where do you go after you make the call? Basically, is kind of I guess where I was heading with this. Right. So, so what you're asking is. How, how does that threat escalate? Yes? Basically, but I was trying to explain it in a more step-by-step -step process. <laughs> um, For the readers at home, I, of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, it's, it changes with the GM, but I know me personally, what I like to do is I will look at the chart, and the second that the shot is fired, that is, that is the starting, that's the starting gun. That is when the countdown starts. And then I'm going to basically start slowly escalating police response or corporate response, whatever security it may be, um, based off of a fraction of that number. So if you are in a double A rated security zone in Bellevue and the shot is fired, assume that somebody has heard it and the police have been called. I mean, everything's recorded anyway. You know, it it exceeds the decibel amount for this this area. Somebody's going to get a citation for uh, no, a noise ordinance or something. Who knows? But okay, one d six. We've got six minutes. Okay. In this kind of area, there's going to be a night errant patrol car or a drone, especially a drone because drones are fantastic. Um, they are going to be dispatched to that area to see what's going on. So. Since most combats in Shadowrun that I've seen in the time that I've been doing it don't last beyond 15 seconds, I'm going to have a Knight Errant uh, Rotor Drone show up by the end of the first full combat round. Because it's, it's going to be nearby. And it is going to see what's going on. It is going to do the scan for the weapons and everything. And if it gets taken out, well then clearly there's a threat. If the team has gotten away, well, it's still dispatching a, a squad car, and that's going to be the next escalation. Is <coughs> you've got a squad car that shows up. You got two guys in there. You know they're wearing their security armor. They look like the the two schmoes in the flying car in the Fifth Element in, in Neo New York. 
um, probably eating the same stuff. That's that same accuse. And they're going to waddle out of that car and start trying to maintain order. And if they can't maintain order, they're going to radio for backup. That's when the, the first fire spirit shows up. Because Knight Errant's got plenty of magicians on duty, and they're going to, easiest way to do it, send a spirit over there. Say, go go check this out. Assist the guys wearing the badge. And the spirit will be like, all right, boss, have some more spirit shout for me when I get back at the, at the cantina. And I think by this point, if, if the team hasn't gotten the hint that things are getting, you know, continually warmer, that the water is starting to boil. Um, by that point, you may as well send in the Wasp or you, you send in a Roadmaster with a SWAT team as the as, as the Hughes Air Star is coming in with the Rocks Fall, Everybody Dies, HDR response. And you can generally get that within the, the, the 20 to 120 combat turns that you're going to get out of six minutes. See, at this point, long before then, I would have employed hand wavium, and sure. and I mean, I just I just don't see my combats going like you know like that. I think the the runners, uh, how do I say it? If if the cops today had access to the things that cops have in Shadowrun, I mean, we would live in a in a lockdown police state. You know, uh, what was that movie where they arrested people before the crimes actually happened? Minority, uh, minority report. report. Minority report. I mean, it would be it would be pretty much like that. So, I, like I said, I think there's a little bit of a hand wavium that needs to take place in order for the runners just to be able to do anything. Sure. Um, what I, uh, I I'm using the threat escalation as a it, it it's kind of a an in universe wrist slap saying you guys don't do this here. You're not controlling the situation. And because if if you've got four dudes with submachine guns who are going loud in a high security suburb, they're going to want to put a lockdown on that super quick. And I'm, as not, a G- I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying right. that I'm saying that like in in uh, for me that's just too much to think about. <laughs> so <laughs> right, we just kind of <laughs> right. You know, no, it is. It, I it wish I had so like a hard. little a little. It, if I had everything that I wanted to know, like at my fingertips before I thought about it, then then that would be one thing. But I I'm not smart enough to have threat response levels like memorized in, in front of me. With that. Well, it, and even if you have them memorized, are, how are, are you still going to remember to use them at that moment? Like, I think the answer is no for me. <laughs> right, and and for, to be perfectly honest, it's no for me too. I'm just going to point back at this this imaginary table that I've got up saying, well, this is totally what happens when the players inevitably complain that how, how the heck were there two squad cars and, and guys with assault rifles there in six seconds? Like, that's my hand wavium. And it gives them something that to point at other than me because I, I hate that, that finger pointing at me. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, do you guys I, ever have I to... Cannot... Go ahead, Opti. Do you guys ever have to pull your punches? I mean, because I feel like, you know, <laughs> if, if the cops roll up on on something that's happening, like to the to the pink mohawk level that my characters have been doing things, they're not going to roll in like with like five cops with Ares Predators. They're just going to start throwing like gas grenades and and real grenades and rocket launchers into this little safe house, and that'll be the end of the you know end of the campaign. It's funny how that will segue into something in a minute. Um. <laughs> the idea here is is escalation. It depends upon what it is. Like in the situation that Oz described of it being a double A, uh, a double A zone with shots being fired. It's like, well, if it was just one shot, it'll probably be a really uh, a low key response. It'll be what was that sound? Because it could have actually been something else. But when you've suddenly got people firing full auto all over the place, it's like, all right. We are clearly not about to engage you in an actual firefight, but what we're going to do is we're going to contact Grid Guide. They're going to shut down and shuttle all traffic away from this area. We're going to begin to set up the basics of a perimeter and not necessarily move to engage, but just move to move to track and move to gather information on. Because That's what I mean. Has anybody ever 
been in a, in a in a game where they set up a perimeter and you just got hosed? Because I feel like that would happen every single time. All right. Um, so the answer to this is yes, and I will I will tell the story because I enjoy the story and I have some absolutely gem gem players um, that I, I have crossing my table. So we had a run where one of the players was actually sponsoring this job because he's a little crazy, um, even for the six world, like he's, he, he, he's above opti level paranoid. And, um, he like had hired, him. right. He had hired a team to kill a gyre. Now a gyre is the, the awakened buzzard that uses, uh, control emotions to instill fears, uh, or uh, feelings of, of deep sorrow so you basically throw yourself off of the nearest tall ledge or cliff or, or what have you. And he had fallen afoul of one of these on a previous job, and it incensed him so much that he wanted that bird's head. So enter runner A, who is a um, an archer adept. He's got explosive arrows, all the cool stuff. He, he's the Hawkeye of this game. And... Um, the the guyer is in a protected area. By protected, I mean he is he's uh, on a wilderness reserve. They they set up a quick uh, a quick cordon around this water tower because they want to get this thing out of the city as soon as possible. Because obviously, it's it's going to kill people. So our our Hawkeye um, tries to scale the fence, and one of the security things is you know you, you want sensors on that fence to tell them that somebody's trying to, to get over because they need to they need to get a response over there right away before somebody gets hurt and so the sensors get set off and he's notified of the sensors he says oh well i'm just going to go ahead and and stay back then and see what happens like are you sure he says yeah totally like, okay so i roll the dice and this is like a, a b or a c rated area so it's going to take like an hour for for hcr to show up they just don't care but after about 15 minutes, the the, lone, the the night errant drone comes in, starts scanning around. He's looking around like, are you still there? Well, yeah, totally. And, well, the drone is going to see you, Hawkeye. What are you going to do? And he says, I'm going to shoot the drone. I'm like, okay. So he is escalating the situation. So he shoots the drone. He kills the drone, dump shots the rigger flying the drone, which is now assault on a police officer. Awesome. So... At this time, it's been about, you know, that in that 15-minute time, an animal control unit has been dispatched, which is two guys in a truck, one of which has a trank rifle, because, you know, this guy is going to be there. It shows up. He starts attacking those two guys. So now we've got assault on three officers. And by this time, now all the other cops are showing up. Grid guide has been shut off. The cordon has happened. Because they're getting everybody away because there is a crazy guy with a bow and arrow and explosives who is trying to trespass into a wilderness reserve that's in the middle of freaking, I think it was Tacoma. Like, this was just a crazy series of, of occurrences. And by the time he said he wanted to escape, there was no escape available because he had wasted so much time. And I've, I've pulled my punches before. I've pulled so many and it just drives me crazy sometimes. But he waited to escape until escape was impossible. And then he he got nuked by a wasp with an assault cannon after he tried to shoot that down with a bow and arrow. So it, it's happened. I don't right. like it when it happens. <laughs> but but dear God, I mean, th there's got to be th there's there's got to be some water poured down that hole when they when they start digging down that far. I think that's. I think it's right. When somebody blatantly just decides, I'm going to, you know, shoot the police <laughs> right. for no reason, then you get what you get. But, I, uh, but yeah, I think I think we all have to pull our punches a little bit just so that players don't leave it. Sure. Table. And and that's it's you know it, it's a bit of a crunch versus fluff situation. Like there there's definitely the rule of cool we got going on. I had another team that had to sneak into a gated community to steal an executive's uh, prized dog. Um, the, the, the twist to this was the dog was actually one of those new Ares cheetah drones that had a, a pet personality on it. 
these guys didn't know until they walked up and decided to actually do the matrix perception they should have done during legwork and found the device that said uh, the dog's name. And so they open the door and this dog is, this, this drone is looking at them and they panic and all four of these guys pull out their, their silenced machine pistols and one of them was unsilenced and just open fire, just hose this poor, this poor drone down, completely destroy it. So of course, security's coming, everybody's screaming for it. At this point, I should have, you know, cordoned it off, had them all arrested, everything's done. But it was just so hilarious, I was laughing so hard. I'm like, no, you guys can totally steal a boat and get away because nobody ever expected something like this to happen. The, uh... Words fail me. Threat escalation is a is an interesting thing, just because you have so many tools available. It's not just, um, you're not just sending dudes and dudes and dudes. You have the drones that are probably in the area as a bit of a um, just random thing there that can scan. They have access to the various cameras on buildings, and I'm sure if you're not a a rated corporation, Night Aaron can just kind of commandeer your your place of commerce to be like, yo, we need all of your records from this day at this time, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's before even getting into the magical aspect. Like, in any of those firefight situations where you start leaving astral signatures all over the place, you're going to have a bad day. Yeah, see, sure. more hand, more hand wavium. <laughs> right. It, it is, it is the, the uh, greatest weapon and the greatest weakness that... I think um, opposition will have against a runner team. If if you as a GM want to turn the screws, then yeah, they're going to task that task force to go and go through all the data and find you, but it's going to take them time. Otherwise, they're not going to be ours to go through with it because uh, nameless criminals do this this crap every day. But that's going to... So, yeah, that's, that's the one thing we have going for us is that this kind of stuff is happening all the time, and... I feel like the the sixth world has even less uh, police actually on the beat than than uh, the fifth world does. I think they have a different type of police. Like they don't have probably as many officers on the beat because they have the drones and spirits to supplement it, and right. drones and spirits don't take paychecks. Yeah, um, I think that I, I think that there is like a heavy police presence. But it's so balkanized because you've got Minuteman security and Lone Star security and and Winter Systems and Knight Errant and these guys and these guys and these guys. You've got like a dozen different security contracts and it'll change from building to building. You've got the ones who have the overarching contract. You've got the extra tor- territorial guys and you can't go over there without permission. Like the bureaucracy is our friend. And that is really weird to say. Right. Uh, Bob, you haven't heard from you for a little bit, so I want to put you in the spotlight. Okay. You want me to weigh in on this? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for a minute there, I thought it was like the perfect deflection of the haven't heard from him for a while. It's like, okay. But yeah, I think I think it's easy. Honestly, I think it's really easy for GMs to escalate because, like Opti said. Like I uh, said, you've there are so many screws for you to turn as a GM, and they're all there um, for your convenience. You can use them or not, depending on whether you want to um, escalate or punish your group or not. You know, I, I I don't have a problem with with that kind of thing because because I can always you know hand I, I it keeps coming back to hand wavy them right. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you are the one who decides. Um, who decides? Sure. I mean, it. Um, the the rule zero is it's so powerful. We, you know what the GM says goes, and yeah, we we've got this this great framework, this great static world that that we all get to play in, but the GM still makes those rules. The GM still has this story, and he can make just about literally anything happen to the players and, and the characters as he deems fit for what makes that story work. And it's 
just another reason why Shadowrun is just the best. The uh... but this that is another reason. That's a, that's one reason that Shadowrun and Dungeons and Dragons are similar, in that if you just have normal everyday people with normal everyday stories, that's boring. You know, True. so you 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 walk out and you decide to do something evil that day and. Like what happens most of the time, you know, you, you do something evil and you get shot and you're dead. Well, that's not very interesting. <laughs> so, uh, so like like D and D, we need to tell if we're not going to have epic characters, we at least need to have some some uh, some epic things happen, you know, in the everyday of our, of their lives. So, so contrary to what happens ninety nine percent of the time, they get to escape the police this time, you know, and that could make for uh, an interesting story, even if it's not an epic. Because at the end of the day, they have left evidence, and who knows when evidence is going to come back and haunt them. Indeed. Uh, the idea of threat escalation seems to kind of segue into the other thing that I brought up as a, as a topic, was it, that it's okay to fail. It's okay to let your players fail, and it's okay to, um, to have things not go their way. And this kind of came to me. There was a an episode of the Arcology podcast quite a while ago. Well, there was a person who wrote in a story about a run where the runners were hired to get like some kind of small mom and pop business who actually was a retired either runner or some some not mom and pop person who was running the business out of the business. And then the story goes to, on with like three different ways that they tried to do it. And they just failed horribly, like each and every turn. I'm like, at what point do you let them just fail? When does when do the uh, the consequences come to them? And how many times are are this mom and pop who have criminal connections, be it runners or organized crime or something like that, gonna stand for these same four schmucks coming in and make, giving them a hard time? I think I think that's that's the dance between the runners and the GMs. I mean, the runners want to keep doing it over and over and over again. <laughs> you know, at some level, like as the GM, I'm like, fine, do that. But you know, that that's the escalation that keeps happening before. Um, yeah, be it could be, or the GM could just decide, okay, nope, you're done, you're fa- you fail. Sure. I mean, I I am happy giving any team, you know, the, let them have the old college try. If they think they've got another plan to go through that'll work, I am I am all about letting them do that. Um, I am perfectly happy letting them. You know, I just all I do is give them the rope. They're the ones who are either going to use it to get over the wall or fashion that really fancy noose to hang themselves. Um, but right. They, I always they, give the advice to GMs who when it, who ask me a, about this sort of thing that. That you should never be afraid either to to um, put your players in a situation where they're going to fail because because personally I don't all the stories that I remember of games that I've played I don't remember the times that everything went great I remember the times when the trek hit the fan and we barely made it out alive or maybe didn't even make it out at all. I remember getting shot in the face and getting amnesia. It was great. Right. And I guess to, to, to make my point is that that's what it's about, right? You're having fun. You're playing a game. So if that, that's, that's what I think people, that's when people have the most fun is when they're, they're struggling. Right. It, it brings uh, it brings conflict. Conflict brings brings interest, and I think that's why failure is so great and why it's so so good to fail. Because if you've got jobs that go off without a hitch, I mean it's it's almost anathema to what, what Shatter One is. Like everything going right, it, it should be a one in a million thing. It's literally winning the lottery. Something always goes wrong. I mean that is. The, right, the first because you as a that GM, that's why the that's why the thing that's why there's the joke about the milk run, right? If because as a GM, if everything is going real smooth for your players, it's your job to come up with something to put a wrench in in their plans because because that's what's interesting, that's what's fun, right? 
even maybe not necessarily a, a wrench thrown in their plans just to, to throw in a wrench, but if there's a part in legwork that they missed, and all of a sudden it's like, what do you mean the person that we were going to extract is actually a dog? Now all of right. a sudden right. you've, <laughs> you've, you've got a yippy dog that is in the backseat of your car peeing all over the place and making all kinds of noise. And Do you stick and shock the dog? Are you sure that's a... A good idea. To take that further, um, sometimes I just, I just punish the players. Like sometimes, I think probably best to do this in in home games. I don't know that on Runner Hub or in missions you'd want to be doing this all the time. But um, I had one time where somebody tossed Mister Pink a package, and he said, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to catch it." Like, right, you catch it, and it explodes and blows your hand off. And he just looked at me, <laughs> and he said, what, what, my hand's gone. I said, yeah, your hand's gone. It just got blown off, dude. You just got Luke Skywalker and he, Yeah, it. And he, he just stood there. He just looked at me for like five minutes. Like, I can't, I don't get the role. I said, no, dude, sometimes, you know, dreck happens, man. <laughs> right. Well, in that situation. And he remembers that. You know what I mean? Would, like, that's the kind of thing that you remember. I would have broke it down from them. It's like, okay, yeah, you could roll to soak like 30p from the explosion at half armor for being in direct contact with it, and then burn an edge to survive that situation. And I get your hand anyway. You know. Well, that's the thing. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't caring, and I wanted them to know that you know what stuff's going to happen, and this is what I want to happen right now. I want your hand, and and I got it. You know, <laughs> but but like but later, you know, a year a year on, you know, what I mean, like they look they look back fondly on that. You know, I didn't kill them. I didn't, you know, uh, you know, somehow make it unfun for them to play. But I did do something memorable that that changed their character, altered them in some way. Sure. I mean, on on the hub, I as a GM, I have I have sent a troll plummeting four stories into a, a vat of caustic chemicals. I have killed a man with a uh, with a coconut cream pie. Um, I trapped runners into a small concrete room with a fifty pound bag of flour and an aerosolizer. Um, I have shot a cyborg with a uh, capsule round because I like abusing the <laughs> I like abusing the MSO rules. Um, yeah, we, we we can punish players and that. They're like, oh god, this is this is so unfair. How can we turn this around? I think turning the screws on them and and reminding them that you know there there are rules and rules can be broken will then cause them to think, you know, we can break the rules for us too. And then they start coming up with these off the wall ideas that you have never dreamed of seeing as a GM. Yeah, Ed, um, and I, right. I should say by the same token, I do I do good stuff. For the guys too, it's not just evil. Sometimes they'll, you know, inherit, you know, a, a library from their grandpa or something. Like, I mean, just random nonsense that happens. But oh, I that's think it's weak. up to us to just do cool stuff. No dystopia, crib dark future. <laughs> there's, I could play forty k for one day. That... <laughs> there's something though that I that I sometimes a, a bone that I sometimes have to pick with with GMs that I hear talking about things in the way that we're talking about it now and and I'm, I'm not calling anybody out here but what I'm saying is like we talk about like punishing players and we talk about teaching them lessons and everything but I think it's important at least in in my games when I'm GMing like like if you talk about punishing and teaching lessons it you're you're kind of like telling the story you're kind of like implying that there's a there's a right and a wrong way to play and I don't like approaching it from that way. And I think that if the players want to do it a certain way, then then as long as everybody is on board, then let's do it that way. You know what I mean? I do. And I think what I, I think I said that word punish, and I think it's a it's a, a trigger word for a lot of GMs, and that's not exactly what I meant by that. I meant more I, like I didn't think that's what you meant, but yeah, I wanted yeah. to take the opportunity to make that point. Yeah, and I and the way I just to clarify the way I use it is bad things will happen to people in life, uh, and so I want to inflict that sort of bad things on players to reflect normal life. But I also do the good stuff as well, and it's random. It's not because they did something bad or because I'm antagonistic against them. 
Right, but in the situation you gave them, that box was always a bomb. Right. Like, the fact that you are now throwing a bomb to a person who wants to try and catch it, that's never a good idea. Um, Because it's a bomb. There, a certain amount of that kind of stuff needs to be embraced in some cir- circumstances. So there was a uh, Star Wars Edge of the Empire game that I was playing in for a short while just because we made the mistake of trying to start one up before holidays, and holidays murder games all the time. And one of the players got in a situation where he was going to lose his hand, and he was kind of upset about it. I'm like, dude, why are you upset about that? This is Star Wars. Every main person in the entire universe has had their right hand forcibly removed from their body and gotten a robot hand. Why are you upset? It is a thing that happens. It's not like you're losing essence. Right? It's like the only thing you're going to lose is in a session or two we will get you a cool robot hand and he got this awesome like chompy claw hand and it was like Um, (laughs) the, the other side of this is um just because you fail at a job or you get arrested via HTR or whatever it is, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of your game. There, the the Suicide Squad movie is coming out soon, and that very easily turns itself into a Shadowrun campaign. That's a great idea, actually. That's a great idea. You got six hardened criminals who are thrown and forced to work together, and uh, you apply a cranial bomb... And then you give the players a little bit of room. Your first couple of runs, you are forced into doing what the job is from your your supposed Johnson, or your, your handler in this case. But maybe while you're out right. on your own, you try and find a street dock that might be able to remove those bombs in exchange for favors, and you start doing side stuff while you're allowed out. Or maybe you, you know, work to manipulate the prison system from the inside. Right. I um I had a campaign that, that went that way one time the they all got sent to prison and for a while for at least several sessions the game was about became about um a campaign where they were just doing stuff in prison it was like totally different it like went, it took a totally different turn you know and it was just it was about something different you know and and it might not have been realistic, quote unquote, that, you know, all my players ended up in like the same cell block in the same prison. But, you know, again, it's all about like what's going to be fun for your players. And uh, so I throw realism. I, I I always kind of roll my eyes at and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I always kind of roll my eyes when when people complain about what's realistic and what's not, you know, like really Shadowrun, have you have you like paid attention to the setting? <laughs> Dagrons, trolls, right? right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that guy in the left just threw a fireball at you. What, why are you asking me about what's realistic and what's not? Um, Bobby, I saw that you have to leave soon. Uh, is there anything that I've added to the topic list here that you want to talk about? Because we did get a couple of things from the Twitch chat that were added on. Um, I would mostly because I love to. I'd love to hear um, Opti's opinion on it. Um, I'd love to hear about um, weaving lore into the story of a campaign or a session or something like that. Have, uh, you, Opti, being so into the lore, do you do that? Do you incorporate lore into your games? I do. Um. I do it in a really lame fashion, though, um, in that I kind of uh, my players don't always listen to the podcast, so so they don't know sometimes when I'm doing things out of order. But there are a couple of things <laughs> that I that I really like um, about the lore. Some some things that have happened, some runs that I I feel like um, really get across the essence of Shadowrun. And so I've been running through my players some of the you know, the classic ones and bouncing, you know, uh, forward and going backwards. And, um, but at the end of the day, when, when they run through those kind of cherry picked adventures, I feel like they have a better understanding of the world, uh, where Shadowrun ends up, you know, in 2070, whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tend to go for some iconic runs and I, 
um, and I drop hints and and I and I really kind of go out of my way to to throw in at least one you know big global player you know that they can interact with at least from a distance um, like right now and, and again this this will be really lame but um, this is my pink mohawk coming out um, right now one of my players uh, just found out that his mom was the personal secretary for Thomas Roxborough. And so they have gone to Oslon <laughs> to investigate the old um, uh, Omnitech, you know, uh, warehouse in Oslon. I mean, it's super pink mohawk, and you know, I don't. Who knows where it'll go from there? But like, you know, at least they're they're getting to know who Thomas Roxborough is. So when they sit down at a table with somebody else and, and they say Thomas Roxborough, they go, Oh yeah, Thomas Roxborough. You know, that kind of stuff. I that's I I tend to do that stuff all the time for good or ill. Yeah. Uh, as I said before we got started, I like it. I am terrible with lore and don't really know all that that much. I like to. I'm only recently started running a small campaign on my YouTube channel for a couple of guys. It's a street level theme, but not a street level mechanically. Like they're all playing actual established runners, and their opposition is as such. But when we started out, it was like, okay, you're you're a gang. Who is your who is your rival gang? Because in places like the Barrens, there's all kinds of nobodies. Not everybody can be an sure. ancient or a wiener or a anything else. So it's in that case, I very much cherry pick the the things from lore. Like Turstville is where you go to pay some dude to mug you so you can look awesome. Right. <laughs> right. Um. I, th I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, the Barrens is a great place to do that because the Barrens is much bigger than we think, and so you can you can play around in the Barrens and never really run up against much lore at all. That's a perfect thing to do. That kind of leads me to a question that I have then, which is how much are you... I think about this question I'm about to ask a lot because I'm in the process of building a... doing world building for an actual play that I'm going to be... Um, doing so how much do you think that it's acceptable to to fudge or even you know alter or change some of the the you know lore and story that is you know official canon i i think that's perfectly fine as long as you know what you're doing well explain that, what that makes, that. uh okay <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I guess I would say that like if 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 you decide that like okay in our campaign Dunkelzon never died and he's your you know Charlie's Angel Johnson from now on I, and that's fine there's no reason that you can't do that I just I would hope that your players would know that you're doing that so that when they show up you know and oh, and, and are interacting sure. with other with other Shadowrun fans they're not like what do you mean Dunkelzon's dead no he's our Johnson like I just <laughs> Something about that like rubs me the wrong way. Like not not as if the the GM doesn't have the the right to do that. I, I think they do. I just think that the uh, how do I say that? I, I just I, the narrative is that important to me. And the in the um, the, uh, I th the, the I think what Opti is trying to get at is the the scale of what you change. Yeah, something like Dunkelzon's death. It was a big. Like it brought up the whole will, and that changed right. massive aspects of the entire scape of the world of Shadowrun. There's occasionally uh, threads that pop up on the Shadowrun subreddit where people are like, uh, "My players are going to fight a dragon." No, they're not. They have lost. Right. Or <laughs> I want there's to. Been, uh, there's been one one situation where the where the runners have won. That was at the end of fourth, and it required a military division to do it and two countries of memory serves uh yes and of course uh old Luffy himself yeah um so so yeah i well, mean if you're if your characters want to defeat you know the the red hot nukes and and become the new leaders like okay cool i think everybody who you meet is going to understand that only happened your in your game and that's fine uh but yeah the, the higher up you go if you just kind of if if you just don't know what you're talking about and you just want to throw stuff out there, that's fine. Your, your just players should know that, you know. But if you if you say, oh no, you know, uh, Lothlir, he's 
the president of the UCAS, you know, and you, and you allow your players to <laughs> think that that's what the case is, I think that, that that sets them back a little bit. It's a little it's a little unfair, I think. One so the, I guess I guess one justice. of the yeah to to be um to be a little bit more self serving I guess with my uh, direction of leading this question um so how much should a GM who's doing you know world building in a campaign how much should they be I mean the the lore and the story and the setting in Shadowrun is so vast and wide it's how how concerned should you be that you're going to bump up against someone and step off the path and step on a, a butterfly and, you know, destroy everything. In your Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. Use Google. Yeah. <laughs> right. In your direct <laughs> circumstance you're talking about, I listened to that episode of The Arcology where you were talking about it. Like, if I were you, because I, I run games in different way, you sounded like you were doing a massive amount of planning. And I'm looking at that like, yo, I ain't got that kind of effort in me. If I were you, I would just worry about the the places around the horseshoe. Just get that all laid out, and then as you slowly grow the world, get the input from your players on it. Because you're you're using a location that is not fully fleshed out in any of the the official books, to my knowledge, which is right. limited. Sure. Um, and then slowly, just kind of roll with it. Uh, have you ever played Dungeon World? Oh, I here we not. go. Okay. Here we go with Dungeon World. <laughs> Dungeon World is a fantastic system. It is really super simple, and it has a mechanic in it for kind of how it likes to make you work the world around the players and what's going on, but it does it in very loose terminology. I know you're up against the time, so I will hound you about it in a little while, like another time. Um, it kind of changed my ways on how I run games because it's ask your players questions and then use what they give you as answers. So, yeah, you have your people here. Well, maybe if one of your players has a contact that's outside of us, like, okay, your your player works at, your contact works at a stuffer shack in downtown. What are some of the businesses that are around there? How many people work at the stuffer shack? Is it just like a normal stuffer shack? Like, Allow them to yeah, throw that, that sounds in. like about my general GMing philosophy. Anyway, I th I think your players absolutely should, to the extent that it, that it can be, your players absolutely should be um, involved in in building the world. It also sure. tells you what they're interested in, so you don't go through all of this effort to map yeah, out no the kidding. yakuza, and then them being like, "Well, we don't care about the yakuza. We want to get in with the mafia," and you're like, oh. "Yeah, you offer them a yakuza job, and they're like, eh." Not interested. <laughs> Forgetting that so, one of your players took a vendetta against them or something like, oh, damn it. So here's here's my better answer. Um, if you ha if you're sitting at a table with players, encourage them to know stuff about the world as well, and then you can just you can just tell the story together. You know, so, sure. so yeah, okay, does anybody remember who the CEO of Renraku is? You know, hopefully somebody at the table who likes Shadowrun and is encouraged to read it, then they'll know as well. Um, and if they don't, then just say the CEO of Renraku, and nobody will care, nobody ever at all. Sure, I, I think getting getting to the point where where you are directly messing with the established canon of Shadowrun is probably pretty late in the game. Um, I, I mean, you see like you know Shadowrun story time and all these other stories that players are telling about their their campaigns, where Kansas City gets nuked by. Uh, Zurich Orbital and the UCAS blows it out of the sky. That all happens at the end when pretty much the game is over. Um, but there are so many little threads in all the lore that we can follow. Like, I'm, I'm doing a campaign that is going to be this giant epic based off of two throw, throwaway lines and a splat book from 4th edition. Because it was so vague but held so much promise I can do whatever the hell I want with it. And it's just going to be amazing. That, and, and you can too. <laughs> that plus some of the time situations. Um, Opti, are you able to stay around for a while longer if we keep going? A little while, yeah. Awesome. Uh, as Bobby needs to run, doing his real life thing, um, this sounds like a great time for us to take a quick break and go grab drinks and do that kind of stuff. And it also makes a great time for Bobby to plug his stuff so that this way it... Um, 
it isn't right at the end of a video and not buried in the middle somewhere. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the opportunity to do that. This has been really fun, by the way. And um, yeah, I have uh, I have to make myself available to take care of two very young, very young children. But um, uh, yeah, if by way of uh, plugging my own stuff, I of course, if you've heard of me before, I have my YouTube channel, Complex Action. It's youtube.com slash complex action. I obviously um, do Shadowrun stuff. Um, the thing that I'm focusing a lot on plugging right now, and if you follow my stuff, you're probably getting tired of hearing me plug it by now, but um, is, as I mentioned, an actual play that I'm trying to get going. And it's um, it's re I'm really, really excited about it. It's through my Patreon, patreon.com slash complex action. Um, it's it's going to be available to everybody. You don't have to be a patron, but I am I have to hit the two hundred and fifty dollar per month milestone. We're almost there. We need twenty one dollars more, and we'll be able to launch it. And it'll be really great to get you even more excited. Um, we've got two players lined up that um, that I know. Uh, I'm going to have, which is first is Damien from the Violent Life podcast. If you listen to that, he's really great, excited about that. But also, uh, Mr. Johnson from the Arcology podcast is going to be one of my players, and I'm incredibly excited about that. So, so get excited. There are opportunities to help build the world. My patrons can. So, if you're interested in that, it's going to take place in Columbia, South Carolina. It's going to be in. Um, kind of the the deeper more genteel south of the sixth world and um so yeah if you're interested in that head over to my patreon patreon.com slash complex action consider becoming a patron or not you can still listen to it either way it's all going to be free so you'll be happy to know that i have dropped uh links in the chat thank you you're welcome um yeah, no, I'm glad that you had fun. Uh, we'll maybe do something else similar to this in the semi-near future because there's a couple of things that always seem to come up as questions and Shadowrun is a complex and deep system and setting that yeah. the more people we get playing, if, I know um, the happier if, uh, I am. Yeah, if, I, um, if I'm available, I will be here because this was, this was fun. I enjoyed talking to you guys. I agree. Awesome. Likewise. So I'm going to head out, let you guys take a break, and continue on. I won't take up any more of your time. Um, thank you for inviting me, uh, and uh, have fun. Yeah, bye. Uh, given that Opti has actually informed me that he only has about 20 minutes left, do you want to just pick a topic? We'll run you out of here, and then um, I guess Oz and I can carry some of the mechanical stuff. Let me see. Let me look at the I'll just kind of cross my legs here and deal with it. Um, talked a little bit about how to weave lore into this session, um, but that was more more kind of a specific uh, to what Bobby was doing. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I'm not particularly great at the at the crunch. <laughs> the hand wavium at my table is strong. Um, so yeah, we could talk about the lore a little bit more. If there's anybody who has any lore questions, they can throw that in the. Uh, in the Twitch chat. Twitch chat. And I can sure. I can look at those in real time. I mean, I think I think the question about you know how much to introduce, let's say how much lore to introduce if they aren't familiar with it. Uh, Opti is as a GM and well obviously as as the uh, progenitor of the uh, Neo Anarchist podcast, how uh, how much are you gonna introduce to uh, the layman to the Shadowrun universe? To uh, to my players at my table, you mean? Sure. Um, I I mean I really the, the the thing is I encourage the reason I started the podcast was because the lore was was pretty intimidating, um, but also really life giving. You know I mean if it's the kind of thing that just you know if you give yourself to it it can uh, be very rewarding, and so I did the podcast in such a way that um, it was something that the runners would know. Like you could get that information somewhere if you wanted to. Uh, and it's not really giving anything away, you know, uh, behind the curtain other than kind of um, conspiracy theorist type, you know, guesses. Uh, and so I do encourage, you know, if I have a particular uh, theme that I want to go for or 
particular set of things that I want the runners to know, uh, I sometimes turn them to the podcast and we'll listen to one of them. Um, but that's but that's a that's a resource for GMs everywhere, really. And I've had a number of GMs say that they kind of listen to the podcasts with their with their groups before sessions and things like that, which is always really neat to hear. Uh, but having said that, even without a a lame podcast, um, I think just taking little bits of lore and adding small bits in each session um, kind of has a uh, the effect of building on itself. So that your players will look back after a year and realize they know way more than you, you thought they did. Just a little at a time. Okay. I know um, when I personally do it, I, I just like to I like to squeeze it in at, at every possible opportunity. And it's you know, some of it is it might be a little bit of history, you know, it might be the reveal and then you get a bit of the backstory. Um even just like lifestyle, like you know, rudders are sitting sitting around a table and are in a ratty old squat, and you know, what are they going to do with their time? Are they going to hit the bar? Are they going to go to you know, club a number? Are they going to go down to the stuffer shack? Is somebody going to roll down to the tracks and find the local fight ring, go smash some heads in? You know, all these little things to get them uh, immersed as characters, and then start unloading the, the the pieces here and there that uh, their characters may know but the players definitely don't yeah and and along with that if I am planning something um, like ahead of time if I know they're going to a bar I'm definitely gonna throw in uh, you know, a bar that's that's you know famous in, in Seattle sure. if I have to think of one on the fly then I'll just think of one on the fly and you know I won't think anything of it but if I'm planning ahead, then you know I do try to throw in um, uh, stuff that exists. Uh, there was a question by Tom David: um, How much current meta plot gets put in my games? Um, I have tossed in CFD. It's not been a major plot, but uh, it's been in the background, and the characters have run up against it. Um, same with the Dragon War, although not as much because I have I still haven't wrapped my mind around all of that yet. Um, it's also the kind of the, thing with the Dragon War that's usually way out of the reach of your standard runners. Right. They don't really know that much about it. Um, but it, it, it'll get there. You know, I mean, that's the kind of we were talking about earlier. You know, I mean, it's not the it's not the beginning, uh, the beginning year stuff that you're going to want to throw at them. Um, the older stuff, I mean, I just ran my group through Harlequin. Um, so yes, I do, <laughs> I do think some of that stuff is, is cool and important. And I had to, you know, do a lot of, um, messing about. And that was, that's really my, my big sin there is I ran Harlequin for 2070s runners. Um, and so that doesn't make So I had to change this. Uh, but yeah, I do tend to throw in as much stuff as I can so that the players will graduate from my table. Uh, hopefully, uh, as, as people who like the lore as much as I do. Yeah, um, on the on the runner hub Reddit uh, Reddit runner hub, um, the current meta plots that are going on at at Catalyst's level, um, we we've, we've kind of set by the wayside. CFD is incredibly hard to integrate into a a campaign or, or any type of game because it is one of those things where it is a um, kind of uh, get hit with it, give me your character sheet kind of thing. Um, because, I mean, it, 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 this is literally, you know, invasion you know, invasion of the Mind Snatchers. Um, you are completely subsumed. Your the character, as you know, it is gone. I, the GM, have taken it, and now I'm going to do with it as I want. So, right. try to stay... We, we stay away from that. Um, the the stuff that happens is a lot more local, and it, it's really you know really small fry, small potato stuff. Like all of the games that the hub can do will probably amount to um, a stock uptick of less than one eighth of one percent on any given day for a corporation. And this could involve you know terrorist bombings in Bellevue or. Um, a uh, a great dragon getting suplexed by a uh, professional wrestler, um, which was an interesting run. Uh, that was applied through plot and significant amount of plot. Uh, <laughs> yes, that was that was my entire strategic reserve of hand waving. Yes. Um, 
but um, for, for Opti, the for Opti's sake, it was uh, capsule rounds of Fab Three. That, yes, uh, <laughs> excellent. Actually, uh, it was it was also a uh, hellhound fed with Fab Three that you were hoping the dragon would eat, as I recall. It was so that the Fab Three was there, and that we could just kind of kill the hellhound, and the the cloud of Fab Three would just mosey on over to him. Is that what they used to take down Sarug? I haven't really read that in depth yet. Um, Chicago. I don't. Be- I don't believe so. It was. It was what they did for Chicago. What they did this take down Sarug was, um, a massive actual magical ritual. I think. Yeah, like I'm just now. Have- I'm just now hitting the uh, the fourth ed stuff in the podcast, which is why it's taking me so damn long to get out new new podcasts because they all. <laughs> They like explode now. After, when you get to fourth edition, like there's just so much stuff, and so I'm trying to make my way through yeah. it before I before I start talking. But yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the things that's definitely on my list right now is just working my way through Jet Set and then uh, all the conspiracy theories and the uh, the dragon stuff, and then moving way in, into uh, Stormfront. Yeah, so there's just a ton of ton of stuff that goes sure. on in fourth edition. Yeah, yeah, there, there really is. Like that was they they just were throwing piece after piece after piece at us. Um, and you're about to get to the point where we're going to start talking about CFD if that, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, for a lot of the big lore, you can have it in the background, but the stuff that a runner team is going to affect is going to be just so far in the background that. Your team will know that it contributed to this overarching plot. Like, your team may have had something important to do with the initial release of CFD. But on the Catalyst level, it's still happening, but only you will know. And and you have to be comfortable with that. Right. I think it's as it should be. I agree. Um, I I think trying to do a... uh, L5R campaign or Warhammer 40k campaign where we get all these players together to try and influence the meta would just be, oh man, that would be a nightmare. Uh, yes and no. Um, I, the, I've been pushing for this quite a bit. You know, and the missions to some extent uh, allows this to happen, although there hasn't been a great forum for, for that kind of thing. But I think there is a great... Um, a great deal more that Shadowrun fans uh, have, uh, they have more effect on it than they think they do. I'll just put it that way. Because the people who are behind the scenes writing, I mean, really do listen to the fans, really do uh, take the time to scan the Reddit, scan the forums, to listen to feedback, and, you know, try to make changes accordingly. If that, if that makes everybody feel better, I hope it does. It warms my dystopian heart. But sure, we're going that. <laughs> um, I think there was one other. No, okay. Um, I just thought there was another question in the Twitch chat, but I think oh, you're right. Thomas saying he feels bad for me. I, I feel I bad for me too because there's a lot. There's a lot, and it's all it's all spread out through a whole bunch of different books. <laughs> but we'll we'll make it happen, man. It's coming, and then it'll be a resource for everybody who comes after. That's why I'm here. Yep, no, I, I throw out your podcast link all the time for people who are like, how do I get in the Shadowrun? Well, it's in this sidebar over here. You should have clicked on it, but here it is right in front of your face. Because there's a lot about Shadowrun lore that I would not uh, I would not know if I did not listen to it at work off your podcast. Thanks, man. That's, that's high praise. It is. Um, the, that being said, I believe you are right at about the end of your time. Yes, sir. So yes, if sir. you want to go ahead and do your pimpin' pimpin', and we will uh, see if Oz wants to come back and help me tackle the rest of this. I got no problem with that. I'm going to grab um, a snack. I don't have it in me to pimp myself, so um, I don't, I don't le- like to do that. At least so tell just, them where hey, they can find you. you go to um, neoanarchist.com or look for me on uh, the Apple One the, or the... Uh, the What's the other one? The iTunes? Android one. Yeah, iTunes or the Android version or whatever your your uh, podcast hopper is. Or uh, or just ask your friends to act it out for you. Uh, 
it'll be fun. Thanks for listening. Is that, is that good? That's close <laughs> enough. You'll be, you'll be happy to know I linked your, your website in the Twitch chat along with your Patreon. Because Excellent. that is what we do. Well, that's key. Thank you, Barry. You're welcome. Uh, thank yeah, you very I really much. Want, like, I will say this. You know, the, the Patreon is meant um, not to give me a second job, but to uh, allow us to create really fun stuff. And so we send out, like, stickers, and we send out patches, and we send out whiskey glasses, and uh, all sorts of really fun stuff. So if you're into cool stuff, it's almost like a loot crate. You know, just uh, nice. support the Patreon, and, and that's, it just goes to making more cool stuff instead of just giving me money. It is, uh, as somebody who has recently become a content creator himself, it is nice to be able to to not feel the stress of your hobby and your, your work life as much. I agree. So, But thank All you right, very folks. much for coming out. Thank you. Glad to have you. Glad to have me. Glad to be having. <laughs> it like, was a right. pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> That's what I meant. All right, take care, guys. Yep, I will talk to you later.